Uh, Acts chapter 12 is where we're going to be today. If you want to go ahead and be finding your place, <clears throat> we're going to begin in, uh, at the beginning, at, at verse 1 there, and, and talking about uh, some troubled times, talking about when the church prays. Uh, you know, uh, I don't know about you, but uh, all of us in our life at some point in time are going to go through struggles and difficulties. Uh, you heard us talk about Emily and uh, the Monahans, and you know, I guarantee you this time last year, of course, we were thinking about a whole lot of different stuff this time last year, but uh, this time last year, they hadn't never dreamed, and I don't mean to call them out or anything, it's just the, the, the relation there, never thought about that a year later, they would be kind of separated as a family, one in, a half in Philadelphia, another half here in Landrum for most of the last six weeks with uh, a, a, a senior in high school daughter going through uh, proton radiation therapy. Ne never dreamed that would happen. But you know that life has a tendency of throwing us some curveballs occasionally or uh, some things coming our way that just we don't expect or don't know, don't, don't know is going to happen. Uh, there's people in this congregation today that I'm sure maybe a year, a year and a half ago, you never dreamed you'd be sitting in a sanctuary in Landrum, South Carolina. You, uh, I see people around here that I know have moved from different places and have relocated in, in this area. You never dreamed you'd be here. Hadn't really even thought about it. But God has a way of uh, sometimes these things happen because maybe God sends them into our life. Sometimes things happen because we just live in a world that where jobs change and uh, or, or situations change, and we just end up in different places. I know there's some one sitting down here that thought he was going to be in France a few years ago, and that ended up not happening. We're thankful it didn't, because uh, he wouldn't be here playing guitar if he didn't, if it didn't happen, if it had happened. But you know, trouble comes in our life. You know, how many of us, just a little over a year ago, were just absolutely scratching our heads and thinking, what in the world are we in the midst of? You know, next week on Mother's Day, will represent one year since we started back meeting in person again. We, I, I never, I never in, in, in all of my life of being in church and 21 years of being in ministry ever thought that I would stand in a sanctuary for six weeks and preach to a camera. Never dreamed it. Never thought that was even a remote possibility. But yet here we are. And, and so many things have changed and I can assure you this, as long as we live, things will continue to change. Disappointment, distraction, trial, struggle, tribulation will come into our life. I, you know, most of you know my story and almost three, it'll be three years ago in July, never dreamed that I was going in for a, what I thought was a simple heart cath for not a big deal would turn into triple bypass surgery and six weeks of not doing much of anything. Things change. Things happen. Struggles come into our life. Trials come into our existence. And what we have to realize is what do we do when trouble comes? What do we do when trouble comes? Well, I hope more than anything else, we pray. We go to the Lord because I, I want, we need to understand that that is the greatest weapon that we have in our arsenal. We don't fight against flesh and blood. We fight against principalities and powers, things that... Many times we can't even see, but we serve a God who does see all. We serve a God who does know all, and we serve a God who has power over all. So as we think about today, this idea of when the church prays, I want us to look into Acts chapter 12 at a time in the history of the early church that was a troublesome time. It was difficult. There was a lot, a lot of struggles that we can't even fathom in our world, in, in America, I'll say, today. But from this, we see the principles of what we need to do when trouble comes our way. If you would stand with me in the honor of the reading of God's Word, we're just going to read the first five verses, and then we'll come back and we'll walk through the first 19 verses of this chapter as we go through the message today. But I want to just read these first verses because... I want you to understand what's happening. The church is beginning to blossom. It's grown outside of Jerusalem, uh, but now we're, we're kind of shifting the picture back toward Jerusalem. They've been in Antioch. Uh, Barnabas and Saul are there, but now we shift the picture back toward Jerusalem and, and, and how this religious group is 
persecuting the, the true, those uh, true to the faith, those new Christians. And it says, now at that time, that's at that time when a lot of stuff was happening, when the, the, they were beginning to go into famine even. It says, at that time, Herod, the king. Now, this is not the Herod that you know about earlier. This is Herod Agrippa I. It's the descendant uh, of the earlier Herods we, we, we talked about. But at this time, Herod the king, he was very much like the others, laid hands on some of those who belonged to the church in order to mistreat them. And he had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread, and when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out before the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but listen to this, but prayer for him was being made fervently by the church of God. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to pray. We thank you for your truth of your word. God, teach us and move in our lives according to it. In Christ's name, amen. You can be seated. This morning, I want you to understand that difficult times come in life. Difficult struggles are going to are gonna arise in your life. It's been said by many preacher of old, you're either uh, going into a trial, you're in the middle of a trial, or you're coming out of one almost all the time in our life. And maybe some are small, some are bigger. Uh, we've all been through different things in our life, but every one of us are going to go through struggles. Some of you have been through the struggle of a, of a failed marriage. Some of you have been through the struggle of uh, disappointments or, or problems within, within your own family. Some of you have been through health struggles and trials within your family or within your own personal life. Some of you have been through the struggle of, of the loss of a job or, or a, a variety of other things. We could, we could make a list uh, if we went around the room uh, as long as you could think of the problems and struggles that we go through within life. Most of us have not had to deal with the struggle that we read about in our text today called the persecution for being a believer. I was sharing with the early service this morning, as I think back over my life, I can only think of really, really two instances that I would even consider, and, and, and it doesn't even, even compare to anything like we read in Scripture. But in, in America, we are really, the idea of being persecuted for, for our faith is really quite foreign. It's really not really an idea that we even grasp a lot. Many of you, like myself, may look at the different things like the Voice of the Martyrs or, or other websites or different uh, uh, journals that keep up with what is happening around the world where real persecution does happen. We've read stories of, of pastors in China or in India or in other Middle Eastern countries or uh, Southeast Asia who have been imprisoned because of their faith, who have been told to not preach or go to jail or, or suffer death. We, we've read those stories but to most, for most of us, that in our personal lives is a foreign thought. It's not something that we've ever really had to deal with. I, I, I told the earlier service, I, I can think of two times in my life. One, where uh, I was coming home uh, in college, I was right, really getting serious about my faith, really was when I really began to truly try to walk with the Lord and serve the Lord. And I was coming home to go on a church visitation. And one of my roommates who wasn't brought up in church had never very little of anything with the faith, kind of made the comment to me about going home. Where was I going? And I was driving from Spartanburg to Easy to do this. And why are you doing that? I, well, because that's what, I'm, that's what I need to do. That's what I feel like I'm, I'm supposed to do. And, oh, you're not going to become one of them old Bible thumpers, are you? I mean, you kind of that, oh, I don't, know how, I don't know how I endured that persecution. You know what I mean? But that, that's, that's about the gist of what most of us deal with, isn't it? Another time I, I just stood with a family and uh, there was a set of grandparents that were, was trying to, intervene, trying to interfere with a, with a family situation. And I stood with the, the, the young couple and, you know, they, they rode around town in the church, previous church I pastored and had signs about me being a false prophet and all this kind of you know, stuff, right? I mean, you know, just really godly stuff, you know, it was really, you know, really fun, enjoyable time in my life, but, but I knew I had done nothing wrong. But in really, even then it wasn't, you can call that persecution, but it's really not. Now, some of you may have experienced different than that, but I don't, in America, I don't know of anybody, I've never heard anybody tell a story of getting fired from their job necessarily because they lost their faith. Although, of course, they live out there. I'm sure there may be some of those here in our nation. Um, I'm sure there may be other things that have happened, but really and truthfully, we don't understand persecution like what we read about in the text today. But trouble, we understand, right? And, and really, it all comes together because what does trouble do? 
Trouble will do one of two things. Strife, trouble, um, persecution, you name it. It'll do one of two things. It'll drive you to the cross or it'll drive you away from it. That's really the two, the two options that it has. And today I wanna, I wanna show you what a church does. And this is what's so important because as we look at our society today, uh, I say this almost every week. I mean, uh, as, you, as you look at the news or you read the paper or, or whatever you do, as you follow the, the, the stream on your social media, whatever you do, you look around and you see that our world is at strife with one another. There are a lot of issues going on in our society right now. There are a lot of things that are, that are, that are being put out there. There's a lot of things that are being said. There's a lot of things that are being done that cause grief in the heart of the church. And I want to tell you this today, folks, there's only one hope that our world has. And that's that victory in Jesus that we sang about just a little while ago. Uh, our world wants to do it, thinks it needs a lot of things, but I want to tell you what our world truly needs is it needs the church to be on its face before God, crying out on behalf of this nation. You see, as we, as we pick up this passage of scripture today, as we pick up where we are, we see that there's a trouble. And when we think about this, we, uh, we, we, first of all, we start to say, as we saw there in verse five, when trouble arises, the church prays. When the trouble arises, the church should pray. That's the first and foremost thing that we should do. It's the most natural response for the Christian. Can I ask you, what is your natural response when trouble comes your way? When you hear, when you get that diagnosis, when you get that phone call, when that, whatever that news is that comes or whatever that situation is that happens in your life that, uh, that just absolutely rocks your world, what is it that you do first? For us, as, and when I say the church, I'm talking about us as individuals. I'm not talking about bricks and mortar. I'm not talking about walls. I'm talking about the individual members that sit in these pews, that sit in these chairs. Listen, when God... When, when, when the world comes knocking on our door, when the world comes trying to beat us down, what is the first thing we do? The most natural response we should do is fall on our knees and pray. I share this story often, but it's the most poignant illustration I've ever seen of this aspect. You see, when I was, before I was in the ministry, we went to Rock Springs Baptist Church in Italy, South Carolina. And many of you know, um, oh, I just went blank. Pastor Lawson. Uh, Pastor Lawson, who, pastors, who lives down toward Inman now, he pastored over this way. His first wife and he had, his, their, their youngest son was one of my best friends in elementary school. And they, they left the area. They were at Glenwood Baptist Church in East of South Carolina. And they left to go be missionaries in Rome, Italy. And, um, and, and after many, many years, and I think I was married, Rhonda and I were sitting about where Vicky's sitting, probably in, in, in relation at that church, about five or six rows back in our sanctuary that night, they had been there sharing on a Wednesday night about their ministry in Rome and how that God had been working. And, 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 and the wife had just got up and finished sharing. Mr. Lawson had just got up and shared and said, sat down and we were watching a video of some ministry they were doing. We were watching a video of her playing the piano. And I forget what hymn she was actually playing at the time, but she was playing beautifully. And all of a sudden we were about two rows behind where they were sitting, where they'd come down to sit. And I saw her tense up and lock up and then slump toward her husband. At that time, you know, I'm, I'm probably in my early to mid 20s, didn't really understand what was happening. The next thing I know, I see people running from everywhere. I see uh, a, a, an ER doctor that was in our church at the time jump over the pews and he's running to her. I see nurses. The next thing I know, they have her in the floor and they're working on her because something bad has just happened. I mean, here we are. There, she just walked off the platform sharing about her faith and the work they were doing in, in Italy. And we're watching a video of her playing a piano. And now all of a sudden she's in the floor unconscious and we don't know what's happened. And I share that not to be grim, but I share this because I saw the most poignant picture of what the church does when trouble hits at that moment. Because I'm sitting here and as I'm, I'm, I'm just amazed by what's happening here, I immediately, my eyes go to right here, which is right next to almost the pew I'm sitting in. And, I, and Mr. Lawson is not falling down. And he's not going crazy. He is on his knees looking toward heaven, and he's talking to God. He knows what's probably happening to his wife. He knows the trouble that's just instant, I mean, instantaneously hit his life. And what has he done? He goes to his father. In the story we just read a moment ago, there is intense persecution happening in the church. 
James, one of the, fir- the, the first apostle that is martyred. Now, we know Stephen was the first martyr, but now, but now we see James, one of the first apostles to be martyred. Herod, is, is, he's taken up Saul's mantle. Saul has changed teams. You know, he's gone from persecutor to, to, to leader in the church. So now somebody's got to take up the mantle of being the chief persecutor. So Herod says, hey, why not me? It'll keep me in good graces with the Jews. It'll keep me in good graces with the Romans. So I'll stay in authority. I can, you know, I, it's a win-win for Herod. If I keep, you know, killing these Christians and persecuting them, the Jews will love me. And if that keeps this insurrection down, these Christians are causing in my territory, the Romans will love me. So, hey, it's a win-win. So he, uh, he, he says he sees how much it, isn't it sad to read in the, that, that someone got killed and it, the next phrase says it pleased the Jews. How depraved do we have to get when it makes us happy that someone dies. But you know what? I see it even in America. You know, I, I remember when Osama bin Laden was killed. And I, and I, I know he did a lot of terrible things. He did a, a multitude of terrible things. But you know, it, it pained my heart when our military took him down. And, and, and I saw what I saw in third world countries. I saw people in the streets of America rejoicing and celebrating. I want to tell you what, the death of someone is never a time to celebrate except for the death of a believer. Because the death of a believer means they've gone home to be with the Lord. It's never a time to celebrate. And it pains my heart. But Herod sees this. And so what does he do? He, he immediately goes and arrests Peter. He says, hey, if, if killing James gets me on their good side, imagine what will happen if I take out Peter. Peter's been the, one of the biggest thorns in the flesh. I mean, they'd been arrested before. And remember, he, he somehow miraculously escaped. When they went and looked for him, him and John were over preaching in the synagogue instead of being in jail where they left him the night before. So he says, I'm going to get Peter. And, and, and look at what he does. We, we see as we kind of think about this picture, um, we see that the picture here of, uh, of Peter being arrested and this trouble coming out. But what we see is in verse 5 that the church prays. It's the most natural response that we can do when trouble comes our way. Over and over and over again. I think some, some 20, 15 to 20 times in the book of Acts alone, Luke references the church in prayer. We go back to what happened after Jesus had been crucified and resurrected and he ascended. They immediately went back to Jerusalem. What did they, do? they got in an upper room and they just stayed there and they prayed until the Holy Spirit fell and Pentecost came. Again and again and again, we read in Scripture how that the church got together and they prayed together, they stayed together. Why? Because I read this this week and I love this statement. Because calm Christians pray during a crisis in their lives. Did you hear that? Calm Christians pray during a crisis in their life. That's what I saw Pastor Lawson doing that night. A crisis hit his life and he fell to his knees in prayer. I've seen other believers that when crisis comes in their lives that might absolutely destroy someone else, they go to the Lord in prayer. Why? Because, you know, the church understood that the best thing they could do was to earnestly pray to God on Peter's behalf. That's what we realize as Christians. The best thing we can do is to earnestly go to God on someone else's behalf. You know, the thing we realize is that prayer is really our only available weapon. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 says, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses or the breaking down of strongholds, another translation says of that. W.A. Criswell, great preacher of old, described the intercession of the church on behalf of Peter this way. He said, did you know that prayer is the real battlefield of the world? The whole universe looks down upon that little group interceding for the life of their chief apostle, God looks down upon it. The angels look down upon it. The hosts of heaven look down upon it. The powers that be, the ages, look down upon it. The real battlefield where the decisive events of time and history are are decided is in the faithful group of followers of the Lord who are down on their knees praying without ceasing to God. Peter was arrested. Peter's in jail. And what is the church doing? It's praying. Oh, they could have had every right to go do a sit-in at the, uh, at the synagogue. They could have went out and made, got torches and banners and, and began to protest. They could have done all kinds of things, but you know, they didn't do that. What did they do? They went to the one who could make a difference. We look around our world today and we see chaos. 
we see struggle. We see anxiety. We see fighting. We see, um, as I shared, I don't know that our, since the Civil War, I don't know that our nation has ever been this divided. What does it need? It doesn't need me to go out and hold up a sign. <laughs> it doesn't need me to go to a rally. It needs me to go to the throne. It needs me to go to God the Father and cry out on his behalf. This church began to pray. And what you'll see is this is they continued to pray. It was on. It was over. It says over the week of unleavened bread. This was an entire week that Peter was probably in prison. And it said that they fervently and earnestly prayed. Can I ask you a question today? How long has it been since the church of Jesus Christ got together and just prayed for its nation? I mean fervently prayed. You know, it's, it's, I don't think it's any coincidence that this passage of Scripture comes up this week. Because this Thursday, and had the first Thursday in May, for as long as I can remember, has been set aside by our, by our government as the National Day of Prayer. And I'm going to tell you, this Thursday at 12 noon, our sanctuary is going to be open, and we're inviting whoever would like to to come in, and we're going to have a time of prayer for our nation. But I want to tell you, it shouldn't stop there. Just because we're not necessarily gathered together doesn't, ne doesn't mean that we can't be praying together. And folks, if our world, if our nation has any hope of survival, it's not going to come through the, the next politician. It's not going to come through the next policy. It's going to come through the people of God getting on their face before God and crying out to God on behalf of this great country. That's where change is going to happen. That's where this nation will be saved. You see, it's not in riots and protests. It's in prayer because prayer shows our trust and dependence on the Lord. What are you trusting in today? Are you trusting in your own wit? Are you trusting in your own uh, ingenuity to get out of the, tr the struggle, the trial that you're in? You know, the best thing we can trust in is the Lord. Because you see, when trouble arises, when real trouble hits, the church prays. But secondly, when the church prays, I love this part. When the church prays, God moves. When the church prays, God moves. God is, uh, he is active in the prayer life of the individual. Look down at verse six. It says, on the very night when Herod was about to bring Peter forward, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains and guards in front of the door were watching over the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared and a light shone in the cell and he struck Peter's side and woke him up saying, get up quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, gird yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and continued to follow. And he did not know what was, what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they had passed the first and second guard, and they came to the iron gate that leads into the city, which opened for them by itself, and they went out and went along one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. And Peter came to himself and said, Now I know for sure that the Lord has sent forth his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. When the church prays, God moves. The church had been gathered praying on Peter's behalf and, and, and crying out to the Lord. And, you know, and, and you see, the, 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 the situation looked hopeless. Herod had heard about what happened with, Paul, with Peter before, how that he, him and John had been imprisoned and how that they had somehow miraculously broken out. And when they went to look for him the next day to bring them before the, the Sanhedrin, what happened? They found him preaching in the synagogue. They don't know how they got out. So Herod's saying, that's not happening on my watch. I'm putting four squadron in, around. We're, we're, we're going to rotate. We got four groups of four that's going to be with him all hours of the day and night. Two of them are actually going to sit on either side of him, and they're going to be chained up to him. If he goes anywhere, he's got to drag them two soldiers with him. He ain't getting away from me. We have one guarding the door, another one guarding the, another area. They, he was surrounded. In Herod's mind, there was no possible way Peter could escape. So we see a strong guard. But that's not the best part of the picture. The best part of the picture is we see uh, the sleeping servant. Now, I don't know about you, but let's just say 
one of our good friends in the ministry has just been executed. Now I'm the next to be arrested by the same dude. And I'm in prison chained to two guards. I don't know. I'm Maybe I'm just a little anxious. You know, maybe you're not. I'm probably just a little bit leery of what's going to happen. I'm kind of thinking, you know, I saw what happened to James and I don't exactly desire that. I'm not afraid of it, but I, I'm, I'm a little anxious. But what is Peter doing? He's asleep. He is literally shackled to two guards and he's taking a nap. What peace? Is this the Peter we know about from a few years before? The, the Peter from a few years before would have been fighting, wouldn't he? He'd have been yanking against chains and trying to punch somebody and trying to, you know, he'd have been waiting for the guards to doze off and trying to steal the key out of their pocket. I mean, that, that's the Peter we know, right? Look how Peter has grown in his faith and trust in God. And you know what else? He, it doesn't matter to him. He's just like what Paul says later in one of his letters when he says, if I die or if I live, I'm a winner either way. Whether I go or I stay, hey, I'm good. And Peter understands that, so he has a peace about him because he knows where his trust is. We talked about it a moment ago, showing our trust and dependence in God through prayer. Peter had put his, all of his faith and his trust in the Lord, and now in the moment of the, what you would think would be the, one of the largest crises in his life, he's taking a nap. He's just sleeping. He's resting. So much so that when we see the sufficient savior this come in the, 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 the angel that the lord sends in he has to he has to slap him on the side to wake him up peter come on get up let's go and i love the fact as you look at the scripture and how that god works in this situation it says that he came in and he as soon as he said get up quickly his chains fell off can i tell you no matter how bad the situation looks no matter how difficult your struggle, no matter how big your trial, there's never anything that's too big for God to handle. I'm sure the church had to be, I'm sure Peter had to just think, you know what, it's, it's over, this is the end for me, I'm done, I, I trust God, and if this is how he chooses to take me out, I'm good with that. But the angel shows up, and the chains fall off. I, Zane had no clue, and Brad had no clue when they sang that last song, Amazing grace, my chains are gone. Do you realize when you give your life to Christ, the chains fall off? The chains that this world tries to put on you, that the chains that this world wants to, to in, in, incarcerate you in, they no longer have any authority over you when you give your life to Christ. And, and, and it just takes, a, it just takes a, a, a word from the Lord and they fall off. They wake up, the angel says, hey, Paul, Peter, get up, get your shoes on, Let's, we're getting out of here. They, you know, didn't this sound familiar? It sounds a lot like, you know, remember when, 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 when the previous administration had crucified Jesus, they put him in a tomb and they put the royal seal on it and put a, a, a whole squad of soldiers around the tomb and we're going to keep him from getting out. How'd that work out for you? Not so well, did it? They tried again. You know, isn't it amazing that the world just never learns? I mean, yeah, but, well, let's, let's be honest. Isn't it amazing that we never learn? That nothing can outdo God. Nothing can outgive God. Nothing can outpower God. He's bigger. He's more powerful than anything. He is sufficient in everything. He was sufficient to break Peter out of jail. He is sufficient to take care of your situation. He is sufficient to overcome anything that might be in your life today. It says they ran out of the, they went by the first guard, the second guard. Nobody even, how they did it, I don't have a clue. Um, I don't know if they went like all matrix or whatever. I don't know how they did it, but they got out of there. Uh, and, and, and they're out of jail. And they're outside. And it says they're running toward the, they went past the first guard, the second guard. They're headed toward the gate. And then something that we've never seen in Scripture until this point, really don't see it again. It says there in verse 10, that they, they, they ran toward, came to the iron gate that leads into the city which opened for them by itself. You know, it's kind of like, you know, when you're, when you're in a gated community and you're leaving. You know how when you, when you, you, know, you hit that little electronic eye somewhere, they have it hid in the bushes somewhere. I, I never can figure out where they've got it hidden. And you go by, and all of a sudden, the gate just opens. 
You know, the only thing is in that, well, they didn't have electricity back then. And they didn't have automatic gates. So what happened? Well, the hand of God just came down and pushed it open. You see, when, you're, when you think you're trapped, when you think there's nowhere to turn, you turn to the Lord and guess what will happen? The hand of God will come down and it will push your gate open. And it says after they ran out of the city, they got just a little while, a little ways down the street, and all of a sudden the angel disappeared. And Peter thought he was having a vision. He thought he was dreaming. Well, that's a good dream. I mean, to be honest, if you're going to have a dream, that's a good one to have, right? But then it says he came to himself, and he realized that God had really delivered him. And so what did he do? Well, he went to where he knew other believers were gathered. He said, when we realized this, he went to the house where, of Mary, the mother of John, who was also called Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. You see, if we think about this passage, and this is what I want to get into as we close. When trouble arises, the church prays. And when the church prays, God moves. But here's the question. Here's where the rubber really meets the road today. When God moves, do we believe? When God moves, do we truly believe? We kind of, in this point of the part of the passage, we kind of come across a humorous situation. It says that he ran to that house where he knew those people were gathered praying. And verse 13 says, when he knocked at the door of the gate, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. And when she recognized Peter's voice because of her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter was standing in front of the gate. You get that, right? She didn't let him in. She ran back inside. You're inside praying. Now you y'all are asleep. Yeah. You're inside praying. You've been praying for a week, probably, or close to it, that God would do something miraculous. The miraculous is standing at the gate, and you run inside. Can you imagine what Peter's thinking? He's like, hey, there are guards chasing me out here. Somebody surely has woken up by now and notices that I'm gone. He's looking around. What's happening? Are you not going to let me in? You've been praying for me. But you know, isn't that the way we do something? We get so excited that we forget really what the important thing is. But, but I love this. It's not only a humorous situation. It's a humbling realization. Uh, look at what it says there in uh, verse 15, verse 14. It says, when she recognized Peter's voice, because of her joy, she did not open the gate, but she ran in and, and announced that Peter was standing in front of the gate. And... <laughs> They said to her, girl, you out your mind. That's what they said. Girl, you done gone slap crazy. I can just hear it. I, you, I love the, you are out of your mind. But she kept insisting it was so. And they kept saying, it is his angel. You see, in this we still have this kind of belief today, belief system a little bit today, but it was really strong back in that day of guardian angels. And, and, and the Jews were really big on the idea that every person had a guardian angel and that that guardian angel was so connected to that person that that guardian angel actually had the appearance of that person. So what they're saying is, well, we already know that we're, now we're in, listen, this is how I know that they were, I, I tell you, they were Jewish Baptists. I mean, there's no doubt in my mind. They're praying so fervently and so hard that God's going to deliver Peter. And when God delivers Peter, what do they do? Well, it must be his angel because he must already be dead. I mean, does that not sound like Baptist right there? I mean, let's go have a covered dish. I mean, like, let's come on. What, what are we going to do? Oh, it must be his angel. Poor Peter must already be dead. And his, his angel's here to let us know. <laughs> I, I want to have respect for these godly pr praying Christians. But I also want to understand that we have to note something. Here, there's a danger. 
the danger when people do not believe the truth. They couldn't believe that Peter's standing there in front of them. The danger when, when people do not believe the truth is not that they will believe nothing. It's that they'll believe anything. It was easier for the church to believe that his angel was there than it was really Peter. Can we say, oh me, a little bit sometimes in that? How many times is it just easier to believe the truth of the word of God? When the word of God says pray believing and what you ask for is already, you can walk away as what you ask for has already been done. Oh, but what that, we try to spend more time saying what that doesn't mean. <laughs> Instead of what it, just why don't you just believe it? Why don't we just take God at his word? If we don't believe God will work, then why pray? If we don't believe that God can heal and remove cancer and, and restore lives and restore relationships, and, and if we don't believe that, then why are we even here? We are wasting our time if we don't believe that God can change. If I didn't believe that God could change this nation, I wouldn't be here today. If I didn't believe that God could cha couldn't change those people in my life that I know are far from God, if I didn't believe God could, could change them, then why am I even reading scripture? Why am I praying? Why do I waste my time? I could go to the lake and enjoy a beautiful day. But if I believe God is who he said he was, if I believe the God of the Bible and I believe the word of God, then it makes all the difference in the world. And that's why I should pray. But finally... This young girl convinces them, no, it's not an angel, it's Peter. And they run back to the door. Peter's just out there continuing to knock. Come on, somebody let me in before the Gestapo gets here. Since they went and they opened the door, they saw him, they were amazed. And they really began to create a commotion. And Peter says, Verse 17, motioned with his hand to be silent. And he described to them how the Lord had led him out of the prison. And he said, report these things to James. This is James, the brother of Jesus, who had become a leader in the Jerusalem church. And report it to the brethren. And then Peter left and went another way. He says, now when day came, there was no small disturbance among the soldiers as to what, had, what could have been become of Peter. And unfortunately, Herod went and took those soldiers and destroyed them. He, he, he um, killed those soldiers, 16 soldiers that had been there to watch him. Why? Because he was angry. It's what happens. When God shows up, the world gets angry. When God moves, the world doesn't always like it. Why? Because it doesn't get their way. But I'm going to tell you what, God is at work and God is moving and God wants to change your situation. God wants to change the situation of this world. God wants to change the situation of our nation. He wants to change the situation in our church. He wants to change the situation everywhere to bring glory and honor to him. I shared earlier, you know, as we think about this church, these people praying, these people in, in, in hiding almost praying. And we think about persecution. And, and, and for us in America, we've, we've never experienced this. But around the world, it's a reality. I shared with the first service, I don't know how many people would be here tonight, but if we had to meet like a lot of churches in China and India and Southeast Asia have to meet, where they have to be brought in in shifts to some undisclosed location in a basement of somebody's home or somewhere and most of the time, church doesn't start at 1045 in the morning. It starts at somewhere around 12 midnight so they can be under the darkness so nobody can see them. They don't have wonderful musicians and, 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 and guitars and pianos and drums and all this kind of stuff. They, most of the, if they sing at all, they, they, they just move their lips and mouth the words because they can't afford they can't afford to sing out loud because somebody might hear them and come in and arrest them or, or worse. How many Baptist churches would be full today if we had to meet at midnight? And you had to ride in the back of someone's truck with a blanket over you to get there. Because if they saw you, that many people coming to one place to gather, they'd know something was up. 
but yet do you understand that the Christian faith is growing faster in those environments than it is in America where it's free to gather just like we are today? Why, you ask? Because it means something. Because it costs. And when you give your life to something, th- th- there's really no cost. There's no value. Where is the value at in our walk with Christ today? I hope and pray that it doesn't take intense persecution for the church in America to become the church that it once was and needs to be. But my question is, are we willing Are we willing to stand up? Are we willing to meet secretly if we have to? Because we want to keep gathering together and uplifting the name of Jesus. Are we willing to pray? Pray that people's lives will be changed. Pray that policy will change. But more importantly, pray that the church will change. And that when we come together, we come together after a week of personally worshiping Christ, of personally focusing on him. And as we come together, it's just an overflow of what God has done in my life all week long. And now I just want to share that with a group of believers that I love and I'm like-minded with and I want to celebrate with. Trouble's going to come, folks. Trouble's already coming. Trouble's coming around our nation. Trouble's coming around our world. Jesus even said that you will experience tribulation, but take courage. He said, in this world, you will experience tribulation, but take courage. I've already overcome the world. We don't have anything to worry about, church, because we're in his hand. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ, your personal Lord and Savior today, you have nothing to be concerned about because you're in his hand. And according to John, nothing can pull you out of it. The question is, is our trust in him or is our trust in something we think we're going to do? God's at work in your trouble, in your trial, wherever it's at today, just trust him.